I think we have seen a lot of changes. Um, originally, mobile video was um, just really assimilated to mobile TV. I think at the beginning of the market, people were thinking of mobile t video as watching TV on your mobile phone. Um, and the technology has been around for quite a long time. I remember living in Switzerland nearly 10 years ago and I had one of the first mobile TV phone and everybody was very excited about it for about 20 seconds until they realized, okay, well, yeah, it's just TV on your phone and it's not really something that I would be paying for. Uh, but it opened up a, a new ecosystem. I think that it's with um, internet video that we have seen really the growth of mobile video um, with uh, Netflix and YouTube um, and social networks. That's where we have seen the most profound changes when it comes to consuming video in mobile networks. And of course, the services are a part of it, but the other part are uh, the devices themselves. We have seen devices that have larger screen uh, that allow to watch video in a much better and comfortable manner. And of course the networks, now that we have uh, 4G being launched and also with the latest uh, deployment of 3G, HSPA, HSPA+, we have speeds that allow to accommodate video in a much more comfortable and much better quality. Um, so I, I think these are the elements that have allowed video to uh, basically emerge as what it is today. It's video is uh, over 50% of traffic today, data traffic today in mobile networks. And I think that in some countries we start to see 70, 75, 80% of the traffic being video. So it's definitely the dominant uh, service in mobile networks nowadays. Well, I think that's, that's also the main uh, factor in the growth of video. Um, video, uh, the way people consume video or have consumed video until now was, well, you know, you go to the movie theater, you buy a ticket and you watch your, your show. Uh, you watch TV at home, you pay probably a subscription to, uh, or tax, depending on the country, uh, uh, and definitely you pay some subscription in order to be able to have to access to your cable or your satellite package, and then you select the channels that you want to, to watch. Um, the internet had, um, enabled uh, this uh, flurry of video sites where you can go and watch video for free, um, and Naturally, uh, with the advent of uh, mobile broadband, we started to see uh, mobile video coming from that, uh, from that uh, business. So uh, people are now watching video, mostly free video, on their mobile uh, phones. Um, but little by little, we see plays by the content providers themselves, uh, as well as network operators, to try and monetize this video uh, traffic. So, uh, to come back to your question in terms of the business models, they're still very fluid, and it's still very early. Um, the original model of everything free all the time is gradually changing. Uh, we see plays by uh, people like YouTube, for instance, that have uh, put forward um, proposal for uh, YouTube channels to be monetized. So uh, uh, if you have a YouTube channel and you have, I think, more than uh, 50,000 followers, uh, you can charge uh, for between 99p to three pound per month uh, for users to actually watch that channel. So they're trying to monetize that asset. That asset. Uh, we've seen also Netflix in North America uh, starting to uh, play a little bit with their subscription model. Everywhere, everywhere Netflix is a fixed price per month. I think it's $7.99 or $8.99, depending on the, the geography. But now they're starting to look at subscription, whether you want to watch the program in HD or in standard definition, whether you're going to watch it on your TV or on a laptop or maybe on a mobile phone or on a tablet and looking at different price models. So the, the question is still unsolved. There are a lot of different models uh, that are evolving, but what is sure is that OTT is disrupting durably the way people have been consuming video and the way people are looking at video as, uh, as a cost. It's a good question. Uh, I think they're asking themselves whether there is a role for them first, um, and secondly, what that role should be. Um, originally, network operators have been used to 
control that value chain. If you, I think, uh, think about the way ringtones and wallpapers were sold, you know, people used to go to the operator's portal and buy uh, the ringtone directly from the network operator, and then the network operator would uh, take that proceed and uh, share the revenue with the content aggregator and the content provider, and it was trickling up, let's say, uh, to uh, the owner of the content itself. Uh, now with OTT, that has changed dramatically, and uh, the content, uh, when it is bought, when there is an actual uh, purchase, uh, it's bought directly by the consumer, uh, to the content provider or to a content aggregator and the network operator is completely by bypassed. Uh, certainly, when it comes to video, it's, uh, it's a big part of it. Um, I, I think going forward, network operators are going to uh, find themselves in a situation where uh, they will need to be able to provide value in order to be able to collaborate and in order to be able to participate in that value chain. And providing value for a network operator uh, is something that uh, they can certainly do because they have uh, a wealth uh, of data and information that I can actually enrich the experience of the end user as well as enrich the experience of the content provider. Things such as location, things such as demographic information. Um, I think what we have seen in the past is that network operators were shying away from providing this information or exploiting this information um, for a variety of reasons including uh, privacy uh, and regulatory aspects. Um, I, I think that will change because this information are freely exchanged today particularly when it comes to OTT and when it comes to advertising business models um, and we will see in my mind, the telecommunications industry being impacted uh, by this type of behavior um, and we'll see a rationalization when it comes to exchanging data that uh, uh, the user is ready to provide in order to have a richer user experience. There are a few challenges. I think there is uh, the creativity aspect of it. Um, let's face it, network operators have not been overly successful when it comes, when it comes to uh, launching new services. Um, and uh, they've been follower, uh, not particularly fast follower, um, and it's not really what they do best. Um, when it comes to competing against OTTs and structures that are much smaller and in many cases have a much better understanding of what the public wants, uh, creating their own OTT services, I'm afraid, is going to be a losing proposition in many cases. Um, I, I believe that where the value is, is enriching uh, use cases from other OTT vendors and providing an ecosystem to provide value. Um, in, that, in that framework, maybe they will find some niche services that they can launch themselves, but I do not see a network operator tomorrow being able to launch a service that will rival, uh, rival uh, the likes of uh, WhatsApp or Viber uh, or Skype because they, they, don't, they have the wrong DNA. Of course we see a lot of differences from uh, a regulatory uh, perspective uh, and I think that one of the key elements that we can quote here is uh, the recent uh, ruling from uh, the DC court, uh, the appeals court in the, in the US uh, that uh, struck down uh, provisions for net neutrality uh, when uh, they are related to mobile networks and essentially uh, for the first time assimilating the likes of uh, Verizon who was the plaintiff in this case to Google um, and basically uh, striking down the provision for special um, constraints to be applied to communication service providers as opposed to um, content providers. So for the first time they are put on an equal footing, network operators are put on an equal footing with uh, the likes of Google and Netflix etc. And they have the same rules and, and that's all that the ruling says. It doesn't really say anything about net neutrality per se, but it says we should not impose constraints on uh, the service provider on the network operator that are not applicable to other parties such as uh, the, the content provider and content aggregator. And, and in my mind that's a key element because it provides an equal footing uh, for 
competition or cooperation in the, in the future. Um, so when it comes back to your question, how that does that differ in the States versus in, um, in Europe? I think what we have to keep in mind is that a, a large majority of those OTT services and certainly a large majority of the OTT content when it comes to video is actually created in North America. And imposing regulation at the country level for the provisioning of OTT services is not going to work. And we're seeing today constraints in the EU being put by separate states, such as in the Netherlands, for instance, regarding net neutrality, that are actually going against consumers' interest, in my mind, uh, because best effort is not necessarily, it's not at all the best way to go when it comes of, to delivering video in, mob in mobile networks. Um, so I think it is still a very fluid subject, and we will see a lot of changes over time, but I think that what is happening in North America is likely to spread, because a lot of the content and a lot of the OTT providers are based in North America. They will obey to the rules and to the law that are being edicted there. Uh, and I think that we will see those ripple through a lot of different uh, countries and geographies going forward. So this event, uh, monetizing OTT services uh, in North America, from my perspective, is one of the key events to attend. Whether you are uh, in the network operator service provider community or coming from the content providers or from a regulatory aspect. Um, I think it is one of the key battlefields going forward uh, for subjects that are dear to everyone, net neutrality, privacy, um, OTT services, everyone is really looking to get more and more content, more and more services on their mobile networks, but as we have seen, not at any costs and not at the sacrifice of their uh, liberty themselves. What is important is understanding from a technology and technical standpoint what is possible and understanding how uh, mobile networks differ from fixed network and understanding then how OTT layers themselves into this framework and what is the key um, user uh, behavior that will drive the market growth. I think going forward, we need as an industry to reflect on how we want uh, this uh, business model to evolve. And that's the key thing. Today, the business models are not uh, stabilized and everyone is kind of pulling in their own direction. We see uh, service providers and we see network operators being going head to head uh, and trying to uh, really um, own the customer. Well, you know what, nobody owns the customer, the customer owns themselves and they'll choose and they continue to choose what provides the best value for them. And understanding how OTT and network operators can work together um, is key. And I think that this event, uh, monetizing OTT uh, in North America, is going to be um, a, a key answer to that question.